Today we have the U.S. Senator from Wisconsin, Tammy Baldwin. Thanks so much for taking the time. It's a delight to join you. Now, you were a lead sponsor for the Respect for Marriage Act. It was passed by the Senate and the House, and it'll be signed into law by President Biden, possibly by the time people are watching or listening to this. Um, so congratulations in advance for getting it done. Thank you. It was um, such a joy to see uh, this um, both history making, but also difference making legislation uh, advance. You made history as the first openly gay senator to be elected in 2012. Um, what does it mean for you to see a bill like this, which which doesn't have everything, but still, you know, protect same sex marriage to the extent that it can at the federal level get passed and signed into law? Well, it, it's a part of the arc of progress. And uh, what is um, when I look back over uh, many, many years in um, public office and public service, I think about how much has changed since the mid-1980s when I first became involved. And even uh, between my being sworn into the United States Senate in 2013 as uh, uh, the first openly gay member of the U.S. Senate in history, to uh, a few years after that when marriage equality became the law of the land. But I, I have to remind myself that it was not the law of the land when I first uh, joined the United States Senate. And uh, it was unimaginable at that point in time that we could get um, the votes together necessary to legislatively protect um, same-sex marriage rights. We won them in court, but uh, when they became under threat because of the uh, recent decision in the Dobbs case, um, a lot of people didn't think we could legislatively protect those rights. And indeed, um, we're, we've shown we can. On exactly that point, when you did get elected in 2012, I believe that DOMA was still the law of the land until 2013. Uh, so it might have just butted up against uh, against that happening. But what was it Actually, like? A, Sorry, go ahead. It was a great point because um, the the Defense of Marriage Act was enacted in 1996 at a time when everybody was, I, I think, fearful or saying the sky is falling. There might be a state that decides to go forward and recognize same sex marriages. So the Defense of Marriage Act was this sort of uh, panicked um, response at the federal level saying, well, at least the federal government won't have to recognize um, any marriage other than a traditional marriage between a man and a woman. Um, and Today, uh, now that we have seen the Respect for Marriage Act pass both houses and, um, you know, the, that is the death of the Defense of Marriage Act because it is explicitly repealed by the Respect for Marriage Act. It's kind of, you know, right now it's still on the books, even though the Windsor case um, uh, made part of it, you know, declared part of it unconstitutional. It's still on the federal statutes. And so with the Respect for Marriage Act, we are finally rid of that. Um, I, I ran into my former colleague in the House, Barney Frank, uh, during uh, the celebration of the passage. And he said, I was in the House uh, during the birth of the Defense of Marriage Act, but this celebration of the funeral of the Defense of Marriage Act is... Uh, a celebration to behold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And that's, that's been your career. I mean, you got there right at that birth and now today uh, or, or this, this week, now you're here for, uh, for the first funeral. So um, with that said, like, what was it like being in the Senate as, again, the first openly gay senator, given that that body is not exactly known for its tolerant views? I'm talking about when you were first, uh, first elected in 2012 and you first uh, took, took your seat in 2013. Like, was there any bigotry or anything that you encountered personally while you were in the Senate? Not um, that I would um, have observed or, or can uh, recall at this point, but rem remember that I first was elected to public office at the local and then state level in the 80s and then the 90s. So I've seen some, uh, some pretty uh, wild things. I remember a fellow member of the state assembly swearing that she didn't have any gay people in her district, like they must all live in mine or something, you know, I mean, she really said it, honestly believed it. And, and, and I think perhaps to your question, what I have seen change, especially with marriage equality and so many 
um, same-sex couples being visible uh, in, um, you know, not only celebrating their marriages, but out as families, there are hardly any colleagues that, no matter what party, Democrat or Republican, that don't know a gay couple, uh, that don't have a friend or a loved one or a staff member who's in a same-sex marriage. And that begins to change everything. And I, I'd love to hope and think that my presence as a colleague, uh, their colleague in the United States Senate was helpful in their making um, those moves and, and, um, and considering uh, uh, their views. Um, but it also has been so bolstered by the visibility of gay Americans and the fact that that has also brought a sea change in American opinion. Over 70% of Americans believe that same-sex marriages deserve the same respect um, as, uh, as opposite-sex marriages. One image I think that, that was really striking to a lot of people was uh, on the day that the House passed uh, this bill, there was a Republican from Missouri, Vicki Hartzler, uh, who um, pretty much stood up and, and got herself to the point of tears, practically begging her colleagues to vote against this bill. Um, I, I guess, what was your reaction to seeing that? There are uh, what emotions, and some of them, you know, don't stand up. Uh, I know that uh, there were people, I think, with every major piece of civil rights legislation, issuing uh, statements that would suggest that the sky was going to indeed fall. Um, and we heard, even with this legislation, um, it, the Respect for Marriage Act, that uh, that it was you know, some, some sort of huge conflict with the religious liberties that we enjoy here in America. Nothing could be further from the truth, but one of the ways I was able to help earn the support of 12 Republican senators in the United States Senate to support this bill and get it through uh, a, a Senate filibuster was by listening and adding some clarification language that makes it super clear that there is no conflict between um, the Respect for a Marriage Act, repealing the Defense of Marriage Act, um, and, um, and religious liberties. There's just no conflict here. And we were able to clarify that and uh, move forward. Yeah, and what I hope that people can recognize at some point, although uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I feel like we would already have been there by this point, is that people gaining rights doesn't deprive other people of their own rights that they've already gotten. It just allows other people to enjoy equal rights. But um, you know, I think something that we've learned is that that seems like a, like too too complex of a topic for some people to to comprehend. I was going to say the other thing that made this measure so necessary was that. I think for the first time in most people's lives, we saw earlier this year, the Supreme Court take away freedoms and rights and liberties. Um, now, um, you know, is this the only time the Supreme Court has ever gone back? I mean, there, there may be some other small examples, but half of America became second class citizens. And I think that opened people's minds to the fact that an activist court could also revisit uh, the Obergefell um, quality decision could uh, go back and review uh, uh, cases around access to contraception and, um, and, and many other cases. And so that's what necessitated the Respect for Marriage Act is uh, a legitimate fear that an activist Supreme Court like the one we have right now could reverse course on these hard fought uh, and hard won battles. Now, can you explain a little bit about why the Respect for Marriage Act was structured the way that it was structured? Because the bill doesn't codify same sex marriage, but it does ensure federal recognition of marriages that are already established. Federal and state recognition of marriages that are already established. So here's, um, I, and I want to give an analogy in this because we forget oftentimes to underscore that the Respect for Marriage Act also protects interracial marriages. That, um, uh, that jurisprudence is much older. In 1967, the United States Supreme Court um, said that bans on interracial marriage were unconstitutional. And, um, 
At the time that case was decided, 16 states still had laws on their books banning interracial marriage. It took until the year 2000 for the last state in the United States of America to repeal their statute banning interracial marriage. Now, it didn't matter because Loving versus Virginia had decided that those 16 statutes um, and, and even the one that wasn't repealed until 2000 were unconstitutional, so they couldn't be enforced. But look at where we are today. We have 35 states that have on the books either constitutional bans on same-sex marriage or statutory bans, or both in some cases. Wisconsin has a constitutional ban that passed uh, in 2006. So if the court were to strike down marriage equality in the Obergefell decision, there would be 35 states that would have already statutes on the books. Um, and that's what we needed to contend with to make sure that um, if you were legally married and in a state that bans um, same-sex marriage, that the state you live in would be forced to recognize your marriage if it was legally entered into in a jurisdiction where it was legal. So it's sort of when and where. And um, it would be really, really difficult to structure a law at the state level that, uh, I'm sorry, at the federal level to, to actually codify Obergefell, where you're actually trying to overturn 35 state laws or 35 constitutional, you know what I mean? That you don't have that reach from the federal level. So we still have work to do, even with the Respect for Marriage Act passed. It's worthwhile doing that sort of housekeeping at the state level. Let's go back to those states that passed laws banning same-sex marriage and repeal them. Uh, that would be extra insurance, but uh, but those uh, those laws are generally still all on the books. Is there a way to codify same-sex marriage at the federal level, like an actual codification of same-sex marriage at the federal level, or is the reason that 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 law wouldn't work is because given the makeup of this court, it would get struck down anyway? Well, just think about the fact that um, marriage um, is recognized or is is defined and um, regulated at the state level. And in fact, every state does not have identical marriage laws, but they're largely similar. You can't go to a federal clerk and get a marriage license. You go to your county clerk in most jurisdictions to get your marriage license. And um, it's entered into by, uh, you know, the, the presiding officer is either a, a, a state official, a judge, um, or uh, a religious uh, 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 person. Uh, and... Um, divorce. You file for your divorce at the state court, not federal court. So if, if you're, I mean, could we set up a federal marriage statute um, and start having, well, I have a federal marriage, you have a state marriage. I mean, it, it would be creating something anew. And that's why the Loving versus Virginia interracial marriage didn't say, you know, we're going to create a federal right to marry so that we can get around the, the states um, that ban interracial marriage. That's what's difficult about it. I mean, it wouldn't be impossible. I can tell you it wouldn't pass because the building this uh, political support for um, creating a whole new um, regulatory authority that doesn't currently exist would be quite complicated. Well, what's your message to a young person who may want to get married in the next few years, but who lives in a state where there is hostility to, to same-sex marriage uh, and it might not survive the next legislative session? What would be your, mer your message to those, to those people? First of all, thank goodness Obergefell has not been overturned. This Respect for Marriage Act was passed sort of as an insurance policy because we have now this activist court that has made it clear that they're going to review um, past precedent uh, like overturning Roe versus Wade. So, so again, um, to that young person, um, go for it uh, and know that right now you can do so in any state in the United States of America. But I would also say that if you care about these fundamental rights, that um, also be active and look and see whether your state is one that has uh, an old law on the books banning uh, same-sex marriage. And maybe uh, talk about how 
you can be a part of a movement to make the laws reflect um, uh, the, the reality that we want to always see moving forward. Um, but go for it. And even if that dark day came when Obergefell might be overturned by an activist court like our Supreme Court right now, um, then it still means that you can go to a state where it is um, recognized and be married. It, it's sadly, it's kind of like what many um, women are forced to do right now because of the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Wisconsin has an 1849 uh, era uh, criminal abortion ban. So people in need of uh, abortion care in Wisconsin have to travel to Illinois or Minnesota or Michigan um, in order to seek the care. Um, I don't ever want to see that. Well, I don't. I want to see us do everything we can to um, restore uh, the rights we've just lost. But I hope we're never in a position where people seeking to get married to the person they love have to move to another state. But frankly, before Obergefell, that was the way things were for a while. Um, so my closest friends were married in Canada because they recognized same-sex marriage before the United States did, any state in the United States. Um, so we want to keep we want to keep moving in the direction of progress and freedoms. And you, your state, Wisconsin, does have uh, you know obviously there is a Democratic governor there, um, and the the state legislature is is so gerrymandered. But hopefully, with that race coming up for the state Supreme Court in April, we'll finally um, hope, have the opportunity to flip that Supreme Court and then restore some fair maps to the state of Wisconsin, and uh, and hopefully see some draconian laws like that one um, get repealed. But with that said, you know we just had a, a really successful midterm cycle, Wisconsin included, um, except for the Senate race in Wisconsin, where Ron Johnson uh, will somehow continue to serve. So what is your take on the Ron Johnson Mandela Barnes race? And how can we fix it moving forward to ensure that other senators, yourself included, uh, in, in your next, uh, in, in your upcoming reelection, are meeting the same targets that other statewide winners in Wisconsin have met? Let me just, because I'm a U.S. senator, I also look at the the, the map uh, nationally, and um, we're celebrating um, the fact that next Congress we will have 51 Democratic senators in a year that was supposed to be uh, the worst head, headwinds imaginable for Democrats. And um, I think the overarching lesson was a rejection of extremism in most uh, governors and Senate races. Um, extremism meaning, you know, those who celebrated the overturning of Roe versus Wade, those who deny that Joe Biden won the 2020 election, those who embrace conspiracies around vaccinations and COVID, et cetera, that by and large, that was rejected. Um, in the Wisconsin Senate race, um, you know, an exception to that generalization, Mandela Barnes fought that race to a tie. It was um, it, it was incredible. I, I was so honored to uh, campaign with him. And um, that's reflective of a state that is pretty, uh, pretty 50 50. And <laughs> um, uh, you know, he won his lieutenant governor's race four years prior with less than a percentage uh, point. Um, and uh, this was close also. So, um, you know, I think the overarching message is that we uh, rejected extremism, um, but there were some exceptions to the rule. And um, and we've got to, as we always do in a democracy, which is not a spectator sport, we brush ourselves off and we get ready to. Yeah, and we will. But in the meantime, we'll celebrate this win that you had a, a played a major role in. So congratulations again, Senator Tammy Baldwin. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me.